Let's talk about identity. Let's talk about how you prove to others that you are you. If you've never had to worry about this before, you're actually pretty lucky. Because for about 1.1 billion people in the world, this is a daily struggle. Because these people live without access to any official proof of their identity at all. Amongst them are, for example, refugee children, whose identity was lost or never created in the first place due to the state of war in their home countries. And because there is no official evidence that these children even exist, they often become the targets of human trafficking, child marriage, or other forms of exploitation. While these children struggle with a lack of identity, there's also many people who illegitimately have too many identities. In 2016, 28 people fell victim to identity fraud every minute in the US alone. For the victims of identity fraud, this usually means the beginning of a living nightmare. Bills in the tens of thousands of dollars, a ruined credit history, or tax fraud committed in their name are just some of the things that ordinary people like you and me have to deal with when their identity gets stolen. Now, when I started to work in the identity space a little over a year ago, I had a vague idea that these were the sort of problems we were up against. What I didn't realize, though, was that these are actually just the symptoms of a much more fundamental problem we need to tackle, the control over our identity. Once this dawned on me, I realized just how many things depend on this one single piece of the puzzle. And this was the beginning of how something I thought was going to be a regular nine-to-five job transformed into a mission I deeply care about and that I could talk about 24-7, <laughs> as my friends and family could confirm to you. But let's start from the beginning. Once you start reading and talking about identity, you soon realize that this is actually a pretty broad concept. So before we dive in, let's make sure we all talk about the same things, right? So I distinguish between what I call your legal and your online identity. Your legal identity is what you use to identify yourself in an official context, in the physical world. You usually hold it in the form of an ID, a passport, or a birth certificate. Your online identity is a little less straightforward. It's basically a compilation of all the identity data that exists about you on the web. That's a lot of data, but usually with fairly little reliability. Hence why the immigration officer will probably look at you a little strangely if you try to present him your Facebook profile to go through customs, right? What I also realized is that in order to understand identity, no matter whether legal or online, it helps to take a step back. And instead of thinking about it as a mere set of attributes, like my name, my date of birth, or my email address, I think about it as an access key. My identity gives me access to movies rated R, but also to more serious things like a bank account, insurance, travel and legal migration, civil rights, and, at the end of the day, to a dignified life. But how exactly does my identity open all these doors? Well, it does it by signaling the gatekeepers, the guy at the ticket counter in the movie theater, my insurance or the immigration authority, that this is a trusted source of identification for them. Trust is a really key word here. A proof of identity that no one trusts really isn't worth a lot. So how do we create trust in identities? Traditionally, we rely on a central authority that is perceived to be both all-knowing and neutral to create trust in the system. The authority does this by keeping a comprehensive registry of all identity transactions, meaning issuance, modification, and revocation of my identity credentials. 
This registry then serves as the single source of truth that everyone in the system relies on. For our legal identities, the keeper of this registry is the state. Consequently, the state has almost absolute control over our identities, over our access key to a dignified life. Now, in a benevolent state with a working rule of law, this is less of a problem. However, we all know that there are many instances in which neither of those things are given. War, discrimination, or a simple lack of infrastructure can all lead to a state being unable or unwilling to provide its citizens with identity. The result are the estimated 1.1 billion people, or one-seventh of humanity, that do not have access to any official proof of their identity at all. Amongst them, the refugee children I talked about in the beginning. Now, some of you might say, well, this is, of course, very tragic, but at the end of the day, for the other 85% of humanity, the identity system works perfectly fine. And I ask you, does it, though? Just think for a second. Do you remember the last time you were prompted to create a username and password? Do you remember what they were? Yeah, well, I don't blame you. I don't. I don't even try to remember anymore what sort of fantasy word I came up with last time. Sometimes I wish that any time I go to a login page, it would just automatically send me a forgot password link. That's how bad it has gotten. The reason for the overwhelming amount of usernames and passwords we're dealing with at the moment is actually quite straightforward. While a large number of services has moved online, our legal identity simply hasn't. And because there's no reliable digital proof of our identity, each service provider has to keep their own identity registry, similarly to how the state does it. But instead of a passport, we get the dreaded usernames and passwords. And because each service provider creates their own proof of identity for us, they all have to keep our identity information. My name, email address, credit card number. The companies which collect this data about us are faced with huge costs and equally big reputation risks over the protection of that data. Just think of some of the biggest data breaches out there. For example, the 2017 breach of the American credit reporting agency, Equifax. This breach exposed the personal, sensitive information of 143 million Americans. This is worrying. Not only because I don't want other people to know my credit score, but because my social security, driver's license, or credit card number stolen from Equifax can be used to impersonate me somewhere else. For example, with my bank. In the wrong hands, this information can be used to obtain a credit card, file bankruptcy in my name, or gain access to further sensitive information about me. Now, I think all of this really goes to show that the identity system today is not working in our favor, no matter where we are from. So at this point, I really started to ask myself, well, is there no other way of doing this? It seems there is, and it's called self-sovereign identity. Now, I want to be honest with you. This is a pretty recent concept, and there's probably still as many questions as there are answers around it. So, why am I excited about it and think you should be too? Well, because self-sovereign identity tackles this most fundamental problem of our identity system today by putting the control back into the hands of the individual. A self-sovereign identity can be defined as a lifetime, portable identity for any individual that doesn't depend on a centralized authority and can never be taken away. Does this seem a little odd to you? Well, it should, because we just learned that identities depend on trust, and that trust is created through the centralized authority. So how is it possible that I control an identity independently of anyone else that is at the same time highly trusted? 
The answer is a combination of different technologies that have become available during the past decade. Firstly, smartphone technology. Compared to the first smartphone released in 2007, our devices today have over 60 times more storage available. At the same time, smartphones have become a lot cheaper and readily accessible, to the point where even in countries classified as low income by the World Bank, 59% of people had a mobile cellular subscription in 2016, with a rapidly increasing tendency. This development for the first time allows us to store and exchange our digital data in a fast, convenient, and relatively secure way. However, simply storing our data on our mobile devices obviously is not enough. We still have to solve the trust problem. For this purpose, we use a technology called decentralized public key infrastructure based on blockchain. Now, if only hearing this already gives you a headache, don't worry. <laughs> We're not going to go into any of the technical details. Let me just make an example instead. Imagine you could have all your identity data on your phone, thanks to all the storage you have available there. As long as it just sits there and it isn't attested by anyone, it's not going to do much for you. But imagine you could ask your local government office to attest that what you entered into your smartphone is actually true. Your local government office can use a method called public key cryptography to sign your identity data. The signature has a few intriguing properties. Firstly, it can mathematically be proven to whom it belongs, <laughs> making it impossible to be forged. Secondly, once a piece of data has been signed, it cannot be altered without breaking the signature, making it tamper evident. With this method, I keep all my identity data on my phone, together with the corresponding signatures. If I would like to prove to someone that I am, let's say, over the age of 18, I can send them my signed birth date together with an indication of who the signatory was. We can also imagine systems in which I only disclose the fact that I am over 18 without showing my actual birth date, hence greatly increasing the privacy protection of the identity subject. If I can prove online that I am, in fact, me, and what I say about myself is true, there's no more need for service providers to keep their own identity registries with my personally identifiable information. This empowers us to take back the control over our most sensitive data and to become independent of the privacy policies of large internet corporations. But why stop here? If we think a little further, if we truly control our identity, this means we also don't have to rely on the state as a single source of attestation anymore. Wherever the state fails to provide identity to its citizens, we could potentially choose other institutions to fill that gap. A prominent example are vaccination centers. The global coverage of vaccination is significantly better than the coverage of legal identity. If we could use already established vaccination centers to attest the identities of young children and their parents, this could already mean significant progress. The simple act of saying, yes, this child exists, may later on enable this young person to complete a formal education, join the workforce, and accumulate savings in a bank account or retirement fund. You see, the control over our proof of identity is at the basis of individual empowerment, no matter whether in Switzerland or Southeast Asia. For the middle-class European, equally as for people displaced by war. Identity is fundamental to who we are. It is our access key to a dignified life. And I think we have a fundamental right to be able to control it. Self-sovereign identity offers us exactly this. But in spite of this great promise, it is not a silver bullet. We should never forget that with great power also comes great responsibility. Controlling our identity means being responsible for it. It means protecting it the way we protect all our other valuable assets. The reason it is important to think about this right now is because many countries are only now slowly considering 
to switching to digital forms of identities and passing the corresponding laws. These laws will determine how we identify ourselves for the next few generations as we move down the path of digitization. So maybe it's worth giving them a closer look to understand whom they actually empower with the control over your identity. However, it isn't only about politics. It is also about the choices you make in your everyday life. Every time you decide to sign in with Google or Facebook, you're handing over a little bit more control and making yourself a little bit more dependent on these services. So next time, before you press that button, maybe pause and think for a second whether you really want to entrust these companies with the power over your identity. The good news is that there are many projects out there working on self-sovereign identity. And before long, you will see their solutions become available for mainstream use. Today, I would like to encourage you not to sit by the sidelines as the future of your identity is being shaped. Demand answers about who owns your data and for what purpose and hold accountable your representatives for laws that do not empower you with the control over your identity. Thank you.